So please welcome Mike Hildreth. Mike's here with us. Um, he's a professor of physics here at University of Notre Dame, also um, a associate dean in the College of Science and the um, primary investigator for the data and software um, preservation for open science uh, grant funded by NSF to help high energy physicists better share their data. And, and other people too. And other people too. Right. <laughs> so uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been running this project called DASPOS with which several people in the room are involved um, for, we were almost going on five years now. Uh, so no cost extensions are our friends. Um, and so this is a, um, multidisciplinary, multi-university project aimed at trying to understand bottlenecks and infrastructure that's necessary for, we say data and software preservation, we usually refer to knowledge preservation. And it's based around high energy physics, but it's inherently multidisciplinary as well. And so we reach out to as many disciplines as possible. And so um, what we've done is to try to link together both in terms of expertise, so computer scientists, physicists, and digital librarians, and high energy physics and biology and astrophysics and other disciplines as well. And so it's multidisciplinary in, in multi different directions. And so what we're trying, what we were trying to understand, what we're still trying to understand is we're not quite finished, is that, you know, basically we're talking about knowledge preservation. At some basic level, we're all doing the same thing. And so whether you have ter terabytes or petabytes or exabytes or a million lines of code or a hundred lines of code, you still want to be able to preserve the ability to do your research years hence. And so we're, we're looking at different aspects of this problem and trying to see where there is some commonality, where we could have some, some common tools that people could use. And so the, the, the main aspects of this, we're looking at metadata descriptions, so what's in the data, how it can be used, computational descriptions, which is sort of new and different in some, in some sense. Um, can we look at, can we look at providence? Can we describe workflows in a way that we can re reuse them? Can we automate this? And we didn't really get to access policies, but that's another area of, of potential future research. Is there a clicker? There is a clicker. Does it work? No, that's right. Going to be on. Um, so, so I like to think of this uh, this this project of actually is that's um, as being kind of T shaped in the sense that there's a broad kind of um, outreach uh, coordination aspects that involves groups such as Research Data Alliance working with CERN working with other disciplines. And then there's a, a, a narrow focus where we're actually trying to build a sort of prototype infrastructure all the way from data and software all the way up through archives and preservation to test out the full chain. And so that's the sort of vertical part of the T. And so in parallel to this broad coordination uh, effort that I just described to you, we've sort of had a technological scouting party where we've tried to cobble together various bits and pieces of the preservation infrastructure again and seeing if we can link them all together and see how that what what are the down the downsides of the, the choices that we've made can we figure out a, a set of technologies that would actually work and um, and so that's been sort of the technological back end of this and so the end result is sort of a template architecture which I'll show you in a second um, which is fairly generic but we've actually built many of these pieces and in particular, I'll tell you, if we get to the end of the talk, we're basic, we're building something like this in coordination with CERN at the moment, which is really a full analysis preservation and reuse infrastructure. And so, um, so this is something that is, is finally coming to some fruition. So um, the overview of the project, so these are the overlapping Venn diagrams. I have to put a Venn diagram in there somewhere. So we have digital librarians. <laughs> digital librarians know how to catalog stuff and archive things, and they've been they know about metadata, which um, now some of us also do. But uh, so, what? Right. <laughs> well, they do. And so we have that range of expertise. We have computer science expertise because they know how to build stuff. Um, in particular, 
databases, query infrastructures, computing infrastructures. And then we have science expertise where we have domain experts who say, well, what does this data mean? How is it processed? How will it be reused? And we've tried to put DAFOS at the center of these overlapping things where we're working together to try to understand how this all fits. And so <clears throat> this is the list of um, universities and projects. Um, we've had many workshops and we are sharing with our work with CERN and DP Hefner, the Data Preservation and Higher Energy Physics Group. And as I'll show you as we go along here, we've reached out to several other disciplines to try to understand how they fit. So this is the sort of prototype uh, curation architecture, if you will. Um, and I'm not sure, a lot of my slides have a lot of detail on them, which I'm not really going to go through, but just let me sort of point out. So much of what we've done has ended up being based on Linux containers to try to preserve executables. And so if you want to run them, well, first you have to containerize what you're doing, then you have a container cluster in which you can run them. And so then you need something to link these containers to a preservation archive. This is sort of by nature domain specific. And then maybe you have some data over here that you can then send in here to operate the, the containers on. And then somewhere outside of this, you have policy and curation. Um, the red dashed lines are metadata, the, the black lines are data paths. <laughs> so we have some tools to enable you to find these things and to explore them. And we have other tools to instantiate the containers and run them on the cluster. And so now if I were to do an, an accounting here, the pink things are things that we've actually accomplished during this project. Mm -hmm. the, the blue things are things that we're working on and, but not necessarily finished, and the red things are things that we haven't gotten to. And you'll notice that one of the things that we haven't gotten to or we're still working on are tools. And so that fits up very well with the whole uh, ethos of this, uh, this, this working group. And so I'm very pleased to sort of point that out because it's a need that we have. Um, so let me tell you about a few details of the things that we have developed. And uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about briefly is Umbrella, the developer here is Hayan Meng, who's sitting in the audience. Um, and this is a way of basically call it, uh, it's environment specification. So if you want to run something and you want to remember what you need to run it, Umbrella is a way that allows you with a simple kind of uh, XML-ish or JSON kind of language to say, well, when I ran this executable, these are all the things that I need. And if you can specify that, and you have this executable, you can say, well, here, please rerun my executable. And this will, Umbrella will be able to take this information, no matter what operating system or cluster or whatever, you dump it on and reinstantiate it and run it, assuming that all the pieces are there. If it doesn't find the pieces, it goes out and tries to get them. If it, and, or if it can't really run there, it can run on, you know, tries to run someplace else. Uh, and so the idea here, if you, if you, have, you have your experiment, um, oh, this is a font. That's great. Okay. So <laughs> none of these parentheses are, um, thank you, Windows, uh, uh, exist. So I guess those are spaces. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a very recursive slide. Great. Um, so yeah, this, those are all spaces, I guess. Um, so you can run the experiment. You can, you can use a different input. You can change the operating system if you happen to be running on a different machine. And if you have this umbrella archive, you can pull down the pieces that you need to make your executable work, or it's smart enough to go out and find them. And so it can work now on a whole bunch of different platforms. You can use Docker containers. Parrot is something that, that is also a Notre Dame project, which uh, basically wraps an executable and intercepts all of the calls, the system calls, and can redirect them. So it's, that's why it's called Parrot. It, it repeats. And so you can use that to wrap various executables to put it in an environment that you can control. Um, we run this on Amazon, you can use, use Condor, we've, run it on, we've installed it and run it on the open science framework. And so this, is, this has been used for high energy physics, but also open malaria and some ray tracing applications. And so it's very generic. Um, and we're building it into the project that we're using with CERN. Um, another thing that we've worked on is a run preservation environment called Prune. And so this is like sort of like a workflow preservation. And so it, it's with a command line interface, basically allows you to 
specify what you were doing, in both in terms of the inputs and outputs of the files and the executable that you ran. And so, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so I'll just look at the picture and see if it sort of works. So if you have an input, you can specify all these boxes. Yeah, this, this would have shown you what that actually looked like in terms of, it's, a, it's basically a functional implementation. So you have a function which you define, which says take these inputs, run something, and make that output. You can chain these together such that if you chain the inputs over here, you can automatically regenerate the entire chain, and it's smart enough to know that. And so even though the slide is scrambled, that's the basic idea. And so if you can, if you make, keep record, records of these things, then you can use this to reproduce the workflow that you're running. And so uh, we have now prune databases, which can be shared back and forth off besides different machines, and so, or you can share these off different repositories. And so now I've interfaced this with the umbrella project that I've already told you about, so that Prune knows how to set up things, reinstantiate them, and run them on different clusters. So those are two um, sort of development projects. I'll tell you about another one when we get towards the end of the slides. And so um, another, another aspect of this project was to look at metadata. And here, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going through the details. One of the things that we discovered, and this is probably true in many uh, areas, is that if you're looking to describe, let's say, the analysis workflow that you do, it's, it's likely that there's not really a good metadata description of what it was that you were doing. Um, in particular, for high energy physics, no one's really trying to write down the metadata to describe what a physics result in high energy physics is. And so one of the things that we did was to have a workshop where we tried to write this down tried to reuse components of formal ontologies so that we had a, a, a rock solid basis for these things. And so, so this is now being implemented in the CERN analysis portal so that we can have a proper ontology to describe this. So I'm not gonna go through this, but this was an idea, this was what we came up with in terms of, so what we're trying to talk about is a final state. In other words, what was the goal of my analysis? What am I trying to find? And it's got all this stuff in it, and you know, these are some of these are top things. And then, all right, so you can look at the references for that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing it. We also talked about describing a computational activity, um, which this is much more generic. Um, but this is and all of these things have now been published. It's basically how do you describe the inputs and outputs of a computation? How you what the different parameters you may need to supply to it, and how that all fits together. So this is another aspect of the, the work that we've been doing. Um, and so you can kind of aggregate these together to really talk about now a, a, an architecture of metadata where you've got your detector final state that you're after, you've got a computational model, maybe this has some computational observation associated with it. And then there's here is how do you actually compute or recompute what you did in order to produce this. And so in the end, we have almost achieved a sort of full linkage from the final state that you're trying to describe all the way back through the computation that was designed to produce it. And so again, this is something that I don't want to spend a lot of time on, but it's something that, that we've been working on. Okay, so then we've been, we've been extensively exploring containers, not just Docker, but all sorts of Linux, Linux containers. Now, I assume that most of you are familiar with containers, so I don't really want to describe them. But so the nice thing about this is that they make life a lot easier in terms of portability and, and flexibility. And so, um, so we've been looking at containerization tools, how you put stuff, package stuff together and, and you run it. Um, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But one of the interesting points that I do want to make, and this was not necessarily apparent to us when we started this project. But if you need to take your application that you want to run and make it so that it can run in any environment on a generic cluster anywhere, you have to package it up and provide all the information that you need to run it. So effectively, you preserve that application in the process of trying to make it portable. And so these two things are essentially convergent Preservation and portability are effectively the same thing. So 
when we start talking about these kinds of tools, they're not just for saying, oh, I'm gonna use this application again for some future thing. It's if you're gonna compute at scale on, any, on Amazon or pick your favorite cloud provider, you have to do the same work. And so there's a direct tie into high performance computing, distributed applications and so forth in all of the sorts of things that we're talking about if you're talking about computation. And so that wasn't really apparent to us when we started this, but I think that um, exploiting that connection is actually uh, potentially very interesting. Um, great, so this is a mess. Um, so we've worked on, <laughs> so in addition to talking about containers, we've worked on something called smart containers, which is basically trying to attach metadata to the container so that you know what's in it how you can use it and how you can find it. And so that's what the, this slide was trying to um, show you. I, I know I thought this would be, you know, I'm using like the same fonts that uh, you think, right? You think, anyway. And so, well, this one's good, so it's just the, the image. So basically, if you have your Docker container, you, <laughs> you can put a wrapper around it that puts in provenance and metadata so that you can understand what is actually in there. And then if you have a, an archive of these things, you can search across it and figure out, oh, well, gee, there's already an executable that does what I want, I can pull that container out and use it. You can also use that to reinstantiate the container and, and set it up on and run it. So this is just ways of trying to make the containers more findable and useful and storable. Um, we also sponsored a containers workshop which was not trying to respond, it's good. Um, and so you can go to the link there. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because it's very well attended. Also is co-sponsored by uh, the Center for Open Science. And so this is, this is really looking at, are your results, computational results, preserved and reproducible? And this is actually kind of neat because we did the whole thing in the open, or I should say Natalie and company did the whole thing in the open science framework. So everything was uploaded there. And you can go and look and rerun all the examples that we have for the workshop. Okay, so let me tell you about something you may not be familiar with. Um, one of the projects that we've uh, also been working on, and this was started by Kyle Cranmer, who you may, you may know uh, from NYU, something called Recast. And this was originally um, a way of preservation and reuse that maintains control, if you will, over the executables and the data sets. So this is allows, what this does is it allows someone to reuse in some sense a result without the data or the software or the executables being made public. And so the way that this works is the following. So if you have an analysis, which kind of looks like this, you have some data, you do something to it, you do some filtering or selecting or whatever, um, and you end up with some reduced data here. If you're trying to compare it to a model, which is the kind of thing one does in high energy physics, you have a parallel path where you have a simulation which kind of generates fake data or the model that you're trying to test, goes through here, and then at some point you compare the data that you have to the simulation to try to see if this model matches your data. So that's a kind of a generic thing. So one, one, what one could do is to preserve this data workflow, but switch out different models of simulation. So and you can do this automatically because all of this code exists and you can chain it all together. And so if you wanted to compare different models, you don't have to redo this part. And so if you save it, you can basically set up something that allows you to run different kinds of simulations and rerun the comparison and, com and compare results. And so this recast <coughs> framework basically allows you to, so, if you have, if you switch out the simulation block, I probably should have drawn this slightly differently. The filter and reduced thing is the same in all of these cases. And so the simulation block is the only thing that gets switched out. So all of this stuff can be on your proprietary server. And as long as someone feeds you in a new simulation, you can do all this computation and spit out a result without making any of this stuff available to the outside world. So it's a way of maintaining control over proprietary data software or whatever, or if you're not prepared to release it and let people hack at it, then you can still do some sort of physics by looking how new models compare to what you, what you have before. Okay, so, um, so that's recast. Now, this is more generic because, in fact, you could make this stuff available for reuse. 
And so that's sort of what we're doing for the CERN analysis port. And so <clears throat> here we have a, a bunch of different um, uh, potential inputs. So you may or may not know that CERN is now releasing some of the high-energy physics data um, for public use. So it's publicly accessible. And so this is a potential input. We are in the process of building what's called the CERN analysis preservation portal, which will allow people to store information about their analyses and potentially the executables that are parts of their analyses, which are those little boxes on the previous slide. And so recast is another input here. And so what's going, to, what's in this yellow box is what I'll show you on the next slide, is a way of taking these things and actually storing the, chain, the, analysis, the full analysis chain and being able to re-execute it. And so as, as this sort of um, infrastructure, which I'll show on the next slide, if you, if you have inside of here a way to say, okay, my workflow looks like this, my data inputs look like this, and I, they're all, my, all of my executables are stored in containers, you can fire up the full executable chain on, we're running this now on certain OpenStack, uh, and pull down these containers and run them, pull the data in and redo the analysis. And you can do this all with a push of a button. And so we're getting there. Okay, so the reanalysis workflow, you may wanna look at the slide for this because this doesn't look like it's reproducing very well. It's so basically, we have, <clears throat> a way, and I'll show you maybe some, this is the, the, the 10,000 foot view, a way of saving these workflows and then making a work, making a, an actual executable workflow here that goes into this execution controller. And then all of this junk down here at the bottom is basically your list of containers, you have Kubernetes in here that does and spins up the containers and runs them. And so you've got your data over here on the side, which gets fed into here and you can run all this stuff. And, um, and reproduce these results. Or you could actually reuse the bits and pieces and chain them together in different ways if you sort of know what you're doing. And so this is uh, an example, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through every line of this slide, that basically shows that you can encapsulate each analysis step in terms of inputs and outputs in a very simple XML kind of, or JSON kind of workflow specification. And this will then say, okay, I'm taking this input, I'm gonna run this, and my output will look like that, and then the next step depends on this input, and you can chain things together, and you can make some quite complicated uh, workflows, which I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, and so what we're working on doing is, is using this umbrella tool that I just showed you uh, to also be able to instantiate the, these workflows and, and make sure that the computation takes place in the correct environment, et cetera. So this is, what I'm showing you here is completely Docker-based, but that doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and then we have this yottage, which I guess stands for yet another DAG engine, um, to put the pieces together into a workflow. And so what it does, is, as I said before, if you have the story processing chain, you have all these executables, you can stack them all up and run them. And so this is an example of some of the workflows. This is the stored version. There's a little visualization tool inside of the uh, analysis portal. This is sort of a, a the same thing with uh, all the different pieces and arrows shown in a little more detail. These can get very complicated, but you can just write this down and you can just execute this by pressing the button. Um, so that's uh, before I come to the next step. So this is the sorts of the things that we're building right now. This is where we're headed. And so this should be ready to go kind of this fall-ish. Or I mean, it's the, the full chain is already working for the Docker version and we're working on getting the umbrella part. So for DAS Post 2.0, um, where are we going? And so we're, we're talking about potentially another scouting expedition and without reading this whole thing, what we're trying to understand and one of the things that's missing are the tools that allow researchers to really interface or to save what they're doing and to be able to preserve it. And so that's very apropos for this workshop um, is we find that you know, we can, we can make these nice structures, but if the researchers don't have a nice way of packaging up their stuff and sticking it in there, they're not going to do it. And so, and, and there really is this sort of grassroots call from researchers because they're realizing the importance of all of these things for better tools. And so uh, this is something that we're very interested in exploring. Um, and so yes, what we're trying to, you know, study or prototype the kinds of knowledge preservation tools that might make doing science easier 
Because I think there is an economic self-interest part to this. If you give people tools that make their lives harder, they're not going to use them. So if you give tools that make their lives easier and produce the, the types of things that you need for preservation at the same time, then it's a win for everybody. And so I think that that's the sort of thing that we're interested in exploring. Um, I just want to have a brief advertisement. So Ruth Dwer and I are co-chairs of a new preservation tools interest group within the Research Data Alliance. So we had our initial full-scale meeting in Barcelona where Natalie talked about PressPT. So this is very circular. Um, and so in case any of you are interested in that, um, and so it really is tools focused on researchers. And what we're trying to do in my, oh, my cartoon. Wait, okay, there's my cartoon. So what we're trying to do is to understand how to bridge this potential gap here where we have people over here who um, know a lot about archives and preservation and researchers who know a lot about science, but these two groups don't necessarily talk to each other a lot. And so I think the tools or other infrastructure are a key to bridging that gap. And so that's, that's, uh, that's why I'm here, basically. And so I'll stop with that. <laughs> we appreciate it, Mike. Does anybody have questions for Mike? Yes. Um, it looks like you're using a lot of the scheduling uh, committees and like I just talked about, as well as a lot of these options require specialized cluster based computation or at least I need to Some, some depends on the, yeah. Right. Have you worked on, I mean, obviously, containers plus HPC doesn't always work. Do you have any strategies or have you actually you know, used traditionalized containers? So, um, we haven't really focused on that yeah those sorts of computations yet um so high energy physics is embarrassingly parallel in the sense that you know all we really need are, are cores and, and we just run the same thing ten thousand times and they don't need to talk to each other so there's a lot of computing like that we haven't really gone at the full kind of mpi hpc world <laughs> where you you have all these things linked together um, and so that's an, 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 an area of potential future exploration, but we haven't gone there yet. I don't know if Ben has any, uh, anything do you want to say about that? Um, <laughs> no, no, the second, in just in regards to future, I mean, something that you mentioned, uh, well, uh, it's important for us to really define what an input and what an output. Right. We have an HPC, that's not so clear. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, that's a difficult problem. Um, so. Oh yeah. So, so the, 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 for the people off, off the microphone here. Um, so one of the things that is, is difficult in the, if you're looking at HPC is that the computing task, if you're trying to preserve it, it's, it's difficult to define potentially what an input and an output is if you're running many, many different processes to get one answer. And so that's a, a challenge for us at this point and for everybody, presumably. So that's an interesting area of exploration, but we haven't tackled it yet. Go ahead. I'm not sure if this is a software preservation question. It's not, it's, it may be more of a data question. So I noticed on your case, it looks like you're using a CSHP mm -hmm. I know like it, it, it detectors and physics using notoriously proprietary data to put out. So part of your changing is doing this thing. Do you say you feel like a data on the uh, yes. Uh, so the, the question it was for those who can't hear was um, does part of this workflow involve taking a very proprietary data format and converting it to something that is human readable in some sense, right? And so, yeah, I think that um, that, and yes is the answer to that question. Um, those parts are relatively well understood and are generally for many things run at scale. So we have computing frameworks that will do the base level data processing. And those things are both well maintained and well understood, although they may or may not necessarily be preserved all that well. So that's another question. Um, but one of the things that's more interesting and more complex is of course what gets done after that, 
because you hand somebody data and then they go off and do crazy things with it. And then finally there's a physics plot that comes out at the end. And it's those steps that are harder in some sense to, to wrap your arms around because they're unique to the individual who's doing them potentially. Whereas if I'm processing, you know, five petabytes of raw data, I'm going to have to be very careful and do that in a very methodical and controlled way. And so those steps are relatively easy to save because I, we know, because it's the same for the entire data set. Yes? So if we talk about the data that generates so the question is whether we're trying to create a metadata standard for high energy physics. And so I think the answer to that question is at least for the analysis preservation, yes, because we think that at a, at a some basic level, at least those particular analyses are all working around a common set of problems. And so it, we think it is possible to create a, a unified set of metadata, metadata for that, um, which I think we kind of did. Uh, and so they're trying to implement this um, for the, the CERN analysis portal. Um, yeah, I mean, it, again, it's very domain specific, but I don't think um, in the end, the physics that we're trying to describe is actually not that complicated. No, I only see how Yes, it does take a while and you have to make all the communities happy and yeah. so forth. And so, yes, and we have, you know, at, at CERN at the LHC, there are four different or maybe even six different experiments. And so, you know, everyone has their own word for something. And so, you know, aligning those vocabularies and making sure that we're all talking about the same thing is kind of complicated. Uh, in, in your experience, so we haven't really made that distinction. Um, knowing what the workflow is um, doesn't get you very far, but it's at least a step in the right direction. Um, so, but going from that to being able to rerun and reproduce what was done is is like a giant chasm. And so uh, to the extent that we can capture and reuse, that just makes life a lot easier. Um, it, you know, if I were to just say, oh, we ran this, the chances that are that you'll be able to like find that, whatever it is, and then rerun it is basically zero. And so it, it, you can write it down, but it's not really clear that it helps you a whole lot. Okay, I guess that's it. So thanks. I guess now we have a break.